when we were working after I first worked on Olympic Dam back in the late 90s, the next project that we worked on, of course, was the Beverly, um, proposed Beverly mine. We were looking at acid leach mining of the groundwater to get the uranium out of the sandstone, etc. And we got stuck into the groundwater, the science, and the, the impacts, and the, sort of a lot of the uncertainties, and the, the really pathetic state of a lot of the claims that were, were put forward by uh, General Atomics at the time. Um, and the day after it got approved, of course, this was new in, in the age. So despite all of the debate about the mine, the potential impacts, and, and everything else like that, it's like, well, it's a mushroom cloud. At the end of the day, that is still one of the most iconic images of the 20th century. And it's a really good way to bring you back down to earth, you know, sort of like the fallout from Fukushima. It's um, remind you that really fundamentally this stuff is dangerous. We're not talking about gold, you know, and this little badge that I wear is, you know, standard egg nuclear logo, but my dad found the gold that made this. There was no cyanide, no tailings, no waste rock, and no biodiversity was improved because he got rid of the tea tree and allowed the eucalypt forest to regrow. So in that sense, there is such a thing as, you know, I suppose good mining. Um, there can never be such a thing as good uranium mining. So, I think just, um, so it's, a, it's a good image. Now, Nuna sort of laid out this sort of picture, and I, you know, me, people who know me know I'm a bit of a data junkie. I like real evidence, I real hard numbers. <coughs> Let's go through these. Um, currently, the Olympic Dam processes around about 9 million tonnes of ore per year. And that gives us, you know, of the order of 200,000 tonnes per year of copper, um, about 4,000 tonnes per year of uranium oxide. You know, about 100,000 ounces of gold per year, and also um, you know, just under a million ounces of silver per year. Um, at the moment, of course, the, the current expansion is talking about going for around about 72 million tonnes of ore per year, um, and 750,000 tonnes per year of copper, and you know, a good chunk of uranium and gold and everything else. So, um, one of the things that I always get an eye on is look at the geology or the mining literature, and you, know, you talk to folks and listen. Um, is the resource is actually a hell of a lot bigger than that. But it's one of the reasons why Olympic Dam gets so much credibility out there in the mining industry and why people, why it attracts so much sort of politi political gravitas. It's huge. It is ginormous. Right? Um, over 9 billion tonnes, and I always feel like I do a Dr. Evil impersonation when I do that, but <laughs> if you look at that, 9 billion tonnes of ore, that's just the ore. There's also about another 150 million tonnes of just gold only ore as well. Um, and it's got a fair bit of copper, gold, uranium, silver in it still. It's also got rare earths. It's actually about 20 times more rare earths in Olympic Dam than, um, than actually than the, the uranium. It's also got low-grade iron ore, but because of the radioactivity, of course, that means that that would be quite radioactive as well, which is not the sort of stuff you want to make steel out of. Um, but if we look at the numbers, you add up all of that, most of the value is copper, not the uranium. Now, one of the things, I haven't put the number on there, but if you actually look at the value of the rare earths alone, just the rare earths, depending on which number you use, and I think the prices have gone up since I last did the, you know, the calculation, but it's around about 4.2 trillion, just for rare earths alone. So if we're looking at the economics of things, um, why are BHP ignoring that? Now, if anyone in this room can explain it to me a really good, logical reason for that, I'd love to know, because I can't think of one. Right? It's not about the technology, it's not about anything else, or the markets, or something else like that, so none of those arguments make sense to me. So, so in that sense, when we're looking at Olympic Dam, we do need to look at all of the different things that are really part of the thing. So, um, <coughs> so in that sense, when you look at it, the 72 million tonnes is only the first stage of the expansion. And I hate having to really admit that to myself, but what they're talking about, in order to reach, say, maybe 1.5 million tonnes per year of copper, so double of the current proposal, um, they probably have to be processing 160 million tonnes of ore per year which means they probably need to be mining at, say, six or 700 billion tonnes per year, and it really annoys the BHP engineers. They can't work out a way to do that. They can't work out a way how to make it, you know, to get to that scale, you know. Um, right, and, you know, I've looked at mines all over the world. I've looked at Escondida in terms of their production capacity, or Cadelco, Grassberg, you know. Um, people often think that BHP's legacy at Octeti makes Octeti one of the worst mines in the world, actually. No, there are worse mines in the world, called Grassberg, where they dump a million tonnes a day in the river. And I'm not making that number up. That's actually about a million tonnes a day. Go straight down the Ashford River. Jump onto Google Earth and have a look. But that's sort of sense. So we need to be thinking about a lot of the expansion debate, not just the sense of 70 million tonnes per year, because at the moment the current expansion only takes it up to about, I think, 2.7 billion tonnes. So we've still got well over 6 billion tonnes left by the time we finish in 2050. 
So in that sense, we're really, it's a, it's a much bigger project that the implications are at much, much, much bigger. <coughs> and of course, with, with mega projects come bigger impacts. So, right. Now, look, I'll just quickly go through this. So this is the sort of the basic configuration at the moment for Olympic Dam. So I've got an underground mine, goes to a concentrator, so a standard flotation concentrator. The uh, copper concentrate that comes from that is quite uranium rich, relatively. So um, that, that uh, concentrate is also acid leach. This diagram doesn't really show that very well. But, um, but the tailings that come out of the concentrator um, then also go off to the plant to also get acid leach, and that's where they get uh, most of the uranium out and um, a tiny bit of extra copper. And then you go to the smelter, copper smelter, copper refinery, and so on. So if I was a worker at Olympic Dam, if I wanted to be, um, receive the most exposure, on average, that would be the smelter stage. Right, so the mine and the mill also get significant exposure, but the highest exposure are typically at the smelter, because the radioactive radioactivity, um, is, there's still a fair bunch left in that um, copper concentrate as well. So in that sense, when we think about uh, you know, China's uh, record on human rights and uh, workers' standards and so on, that's the sort of uh, opportunity we're uh, potentially going to afford in the future. Now, if we look at the expanded project, basically, as uh, David Noonan's already outlined, it's basically all they're doing is exactly the same. And, you know, I hate being proven right, but um, initially when they were talking up the expansion, they were talking the fact that uranium um, would potentially be 30,000 tonnes per year. Isn't that great? And it's like, well, no, when you look at the numbers, the evidence, Olympic Dam has never achieved an extraction efficiency you know, or recovery of uranium by more than 65%. And when you take the, the ore throughput that's always been talked about to get to, say, the 1 million tonnes per year of copper or things like that, to get to that 30,000 tonnes per year of uranium, you have to assure 100% extraction. So when the EIS came out and some of these numbers finally started coming in, you know, sort of started becoming obvious, um, sure enough, it's actually 65%. Everything is exactly the same, just bigger, 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 and by the way, one of the world's biggest open cuts. And that open cut is not even a third of the all way. So at the moment, that world's proposed biggest open cut is actually only, you know, probably less than a third of what it could be. So, um, so again, a lot of the, the uh, concentrate um, from the expanded operation will uh, go to uh, the great nation of China. Right. So if you look at water resources, I'm going to focus just on the Great Artesian Basin issues, because that's something that I think a lot of us have, um, have not forgotten about, but certainly hasn't got as much profile as some of the issues around the, the diesel. I'll, I'll leave it to you. I'm going to need to talk to you about a lot more. But um, that's where I started. You know, really trying to get my head around it, and I'm looking at the, I suppose, the science of the impacts. At the moment, there are two bore fields for Olympic Dam. There's bore field A, which is right on the shores of Lake S South, and smack bang in the middle of all the mound springs that are environmentally and culturally important. Um, it reached at a maximum of around about 18 or 20 million litres per day. That's the ML per day. Um, they built uh, Boreville B as part of the uh, expansion just over a decade ago. Um, currently they're taking roughly about 24, so um, with the last expansion they gradually reduced the amount they've taken from Boreville A and increased the amount from Boreville B once they built that. Um, we know that Boreville B, or Boreville A, sorry, has had very significant impacts. You know, I'm sure I've got Kevin here could probably talk a lot more about that. But, um, and they're both environmental and cultural impacts. Well, we can't afford to forget that. Now, when WMC was still around before they got taken over by BHP, um, they had committed to shutting down Borefield A and actually switching over that, um, that 6 million litres a day to Borefield B. Um, at the moment, the, the current indenture allows for a licence um, a license limit based on the amount of um, drawdown or declines in groundwater levels from the, that Borefield. Uh, that gives them a, an approximate um, value of around about 42 million litres per day. Now, BHB haven't maintained that sort of commitment, and certainly the, uh, the draft environmental impact statement and the supplementary EIS uh, has been very weak on actually locking that in. Um, so I think in that sense, uh, there's still issues. If we go to a much bigger scale of Warfield B, and it almost doubles the scale of Warfield B, it's not that far away from the springs, and there's still unresolved issues, I think, uh, about the long-term impacts of, of that, um, that that will have.